overview of my social work background, a bit about my organisation, BASWA, the British Association of Social Workers, talk to you about George Floyd's murder uh, and the impact um, on social work. I hope you can still see my screen. It seems to have altered slightly at my end. Yeah, Is it all good. Oh, all, good. All good. <laughs> all right. Um, I'll also explore the Black Lives Matter movement and why that's relevant to social work. And then uh, we could look at some barriers to anti-racism in social work and organisational responses. And um, I do think this presentation has relevance to allied professions as well as uh, you know other professions outside of health and social care. I'll also then um, uh, share some of my proposals around implementing anti-racism reforms and then there'll be opportunity for questions. Um, there is no need to take notes as you will have a copy of this presentation after today. There are lots of uh, interactive hyperlinks that hopefully substantiate much of what I say. Um, so you'll be able to kind of explore that at your own leisure. So my social work background, starting from the bottom, uh, I worked for a private fostering agency as an administrative assistant, which was my introduction to uh, social work. Um, I then uh, went to work for the National Probation Service on an intensive supervision and surveillance project on repeat offenders aged between 18 and 25. When that project ended, I then moved to a youth offending team uh, in my native Sheffield. Uh, and I was involved in court work and community interventions with children, young people and their families. Uh, I then embarked on my social work studies and um, undertook my placements in adult mental health services in a community setting uh, and then in child protection as a duty and assessment officer. I then worked with uh, care leavers and young people post 16 uh, as a young person's advisor and then I worked in uh, private fostering again, this time as a uh, supervising social worker for eight years, just prior to my role uh, at Baswa, where I've now been for roughly three and a half years. Um, and I've undertaken the role of anti-racism lead uh, since February of this year, although I was doing the role kind of unofficially uh, since George Floyd's murder last year. OK, that's enough about me about the organisation. Um, so BASWA is the British Association of Social Workers. Uh, BASWA was established in 1970 and we're a member-led organisation which promotes social work, the interests of those working within the profession and people who use services. We have roughly 21,000 members across the UK and we pride ourselves on being the strong independent voice of social work and social workers. I'm not going to labour this slide, but it really just underlines the Baswa mandate in terms of being the strong independent voice for social work and social workers. And in terms of what we actually do for social work and social workers, again, I will let you have a look at these next couple of slides at your leisure, which, are, which as I say, have hyper, hyper uh, links in there for you to explore further in terms of the different work streams. So I'd like to cut straight to the chase in terms of anti-racism in social work. And I hope that the, the, these images um, give you some insight as to the tone um, and the direction of travel, really, as far as this presentation is concerned. Could I just ask that everybody goes on mute, please? I'm just getting a slight bit of feedback there. Thank you. Oh, still getting a bit of reverb. Thank you. OK, so my perspective on anti-racism in social work, but I guess you can, um, you could exchange the word social work for your particular profession um, if it's not directly, uh, you know, if it doesn't directly speak to you as a social worker. Um, so my perspective is very much personal and professional. Uh, there are very few black male social workers. And my opinions do not represent all black and ethnic minority people's opinions. Uh, we're not a homogenous group. 
I refuse to be the tokenistic black voice of my organisation, Baswa, as I'm one of many black voices in social work and also within the organisation in the in the last few months, we've also uh, recruited another anti-racism lead uh, who covers the UK. Uh, my role is specifically um, in relation to England. Um, and we've also employed an uh, equality, diversity and inclusion officer. Um, so I'm certainly not the only uh, voice of colour within Baswa. I'm not an expert in organisational development or leadership. However, I am an expert with lived experience of personal and professional racism in life and in social work. These are purely my opinions. And just to emphasise that this presentation focuses on black and ethnic minority social workers and not service users. And the reason being that a lot of my work has revealed that there are very few protections and support uh, for social workers of colour. Um, there is a strong body of work and academia and understanding, I think, around um, the experiences of service users. Still a long way to go, um, but very little uh, in terms of social workers of colour. So that's very much the spotlight of uh, my work. Why was George Floyd's murder such a catalyst? George Floyd was murdered by a police officer and the world has seen the evidence. His murder was the latest in a long line of atrocities, brutalities and calamities endured by black and other ethnic majority communities. This has a long history longer than is sometimes convenient for honest acknowledgement. Some commentators refer to George's death, which is a dilution of what occurred. He was brutally murdered. The context to George's murder is emotive and cumulative. There was an incident labelled the Amy Cooper race grenade that happened uh, just prior to George Floyd's murder, which you'll be able to um, view via that web link when you get your copy of this presentation. There are endless examples of police brutality cases in the US and UK, modern day systems of oppression and the historic and ongoing suppression of the effects of slavery and colonialism in mainstream education. These factors can accumulate and create an acute sense of anger and rage. These emotions sometimes manifest into civil disorder and protests. However, Anarchic extremists are known to infiltrate protests and covertly fuel acts of looting and violence, which are used to discredit legitimate protesters. This detracts from the causal factors that trigger protests. Interestingly, little is reported about the long-standing looting of Africa's natural resources, which is ongoing. And again, I hope those images at the bottom there uh, consolidate what I've tried to capture. Black Lives Matter is a global movement demanding for black lives to be valued to equal to white lives. There is a long and enduring history of this not being the case. The retort of white or all lives matter in response to BLM is not comparable or relevant. This is like asking what about colon cancer? during a discussion about breast cancer. Or advising a bereaved mother that all lives matter at her child's funeral. Save the whales does not mean other sea life is unimportant. White lives have always mattered, so to keep proclaiming white lives matter adds excessive value to them, tilting us further towards white supremacy. I'm just getting a bit of an echo there. If everyone could go on mute, please. BLM has its critics, but it is unclear why a movement that promotes equality is demonised by some people who vehemently claim they are not a racist and advocate for freedom of speech. Now, the reason I've put apostrophes around A there is because I think sometimes um, people will consider racism, racism as either people being a racist or not a racist. Um, but I actually believe that there is a spectrum of racism. Um, and to quote the Angela Davis uh, point that she makes around, you know, living um, in a society that uh, is inherently racist, it's not enough 
to be neutral or colorblind, we have to be anti-racist. Um, but I'll come on to that further later on. Here is a chronology of events uh, from last year uh, in terms of how I got involved in this work um, and uh, sort of led on the work for Baswa. I'm not going to cover it in any great depth now, um, but they're, they are all hyperlinks there that you can see underlined. So when you get your copy of this presentation, by all means, have an exploration uh, of that. This is a continuation um, of some of that chronology. It's probably the tip of the iceberg as well. Um, but there is a, a portfolio um, of some of the online resources that I've been able to capture, such as presentations like this, articles, etc., that I've written, podcast interviews uh, and so on. Um, that portfolio will be available to you after the, uh, this session as well. So again, please have a look at that. Uh, and also just to address the alarming image that you can see there in front of you, um, that's called the KCMG Medal. Um, that's an award that is given by the Queen to honoured foreign diplomats. Um, and it is um, the focus of a campaign um, that I managed to spearhead last year uh, to try and get that image changed. Um, it is ongoing. We are awaiting um, a response from the Cabinet Office, although we have been redirected by Buckingham Palace's uh, office to the Cabinet Office. So that campaign is ongoing, as I say, um, but as you can see, quite a distressing, alarming image of what looks like a blonde-haired, uh, blue-eyed angel uh, with its foot on the neck of what looks like a black man. Very much the imagery in which George Floyd was killed, of course, ironically. So current position, I've just mentioned about the KCMG campaign being ongoing and the fact that we're waiting for a response from the Cabinet Office. One thing I've not mentioned is that in a bizarre twist, the original tweet, which is uh, sort of the uh, initial uh, part of the campaign, uh, which I started on Twitter, uh, the original tweet got deleted. Um, we have asked uh, for Twitter to explain this, but no response has been received. Um, we know silence on racism is complicity with the oppressors. Silence can be construed as blatant racism in some scenarios. It seems when our oppressors choose not to attack us, the wall of silence is their other favoured tactic. Open dialogue has remained a prominent source of conflict resolution for good reason. It works. It helps to positively undermine any covert or overt power imbalance. So Basra England will continue to educate, equip and empower social workers of colour and allies. And as an organisation, we realise that we're not immune to the perils of white supremacy and whiteness. And as I've just uh, touched on earlier on, we have made uh, some strides in uh, addressing that in terms of recruitment. But there's also lots of other things happening behind the scenes, which I'll enlarge on shortly. Baswa has shown a willingness to address and tackle these issues internally and within the profession more broadly. We'll consider all anti-racist proposals from partnership organisations and specialist collaborators that will potentially benefit social work. And since, I've, uh, since I wrote that slide, there's been actually a lot of developments and there was recently um, a report which I published uh, on behalf of Baswa um, which mapped all of the anti-racism in social work activities that have taken place over the last 12 months. Um, and it is extensive and it is available by, via the Basra website. Um, so there has been, you know, kind of quite promisingly, quite a lot of work in this regard within social work over the last 12 months, but still a lot of work to do. I've tried to capture just a few examples here of some of the activism that I've been involved in myself. Um, there was a book uh, published in March called Outlanders, uh, which is the hidden narratives from social workers of colour. Uh, that includes essays, stories, poems and miscellaneous works from various social workers, including myself, um, that really kind of spotlight uh, the black experience um, or you know, the kind of marginalised experience of social workers of colour within social work. Um, so we're particularly proud of that. 
there's a number of events, including the Guardian Social Lives event that I spoke at last year. Uh, there's a group called the Black and Ethnic Minority Professional Symposium, or BPS for short, uh, which is a group that I founded within Baswa, made up of social workers across um, England from various social work backgrounds, but from different ethnic minority uh, groups as well. Um, and it's a safe space basically for those professionals to be able to offload, um, share ideas, but also strategize in terms of combating some of the dis different um, racial structures that exist within social work, to be quite frank. And in a short space of time, I think we've made good strides in terms of the structure of the group. We have a chair and a, a vice chair, um, as I say, members across England. Uh, and there's a number of different work streams now that that group is involved in. I also spoke at uh, an event last year on the, sharing the same platform as David Olasuga, uh, the Black historian, which was a real honour. There's a number of uh, articles that I've written um, on the subject of anti-racism in social work, but as I say, I do feel it has transferability to other professions. Um, some of those articles, I think, are quite clearly sort of me venting um, when I reflect back, but other ones I think are more uh, constructive and solution focused. Um, and they look at things like how to um, create an anti-racist uh, culture within working environments. Um, there's uh, some that are focused more on regulation of social workers and how um, I feel they are disproportionately negatively treated. Um, so quite a, an array of different um, topics really within anti-racism. Um, I was really pleased to speak in an event alongside Gurnam Singh and Kishbati Sinclair, who are very much revered academics within social work, but also uh, anti-racism pioneers. Um, so that, again, that was a real privilege for me. And there's been a, a number of different events, podcasts and webinars, which will all be available via the portfolio that I mentioned. Um, so do have a browse. The Wake Up Show. There is a big difference between being anti-racist and not wanting to be seen as a racist, as I was saying earlier. People are sometimes more scared of being labelled as racist than they are of actually being racist. An individual or organisation that is anti-racist is much more likely to recognise why they themselves are potentially racist understand how they have been socialised to be inherently racist and identify the benefits they receive from the existing racist structures. Those embracing macho, anti-woke and politically incorrect descriptors as laudable, even a badge of honour, seem unable or unwilling to view introspection, self-reflection or self-awareness as supreme personal qualities. White psychosis, as described by Kahindi Andrews, is expressed in strange ways. It's a damning indictment on society when to be described as woke or to be a do-gooder or in any way virtuous is considered derisory. This defies my sense of logic and is selective outrage to me. Personally, I think it's an important quality to want to do good for my fellow human beings and strengthen our societal interdependence. I challenge anti-woke people to actually define the word woke. Many of their responses are laced with absurdities. Some cite the Commonwealth as a victory on race relations. Common, wealth, for who? Possibly a Freudian slip in retrospect. Ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy social justice can have. And that's a quote from J James Baldwin, which I've just altered slightly. What is anti-racism? Anti-racism is a belief that all races and ethnic groups are equal and deserving of the same opportunities. But the most important part of anti-racism is the next step which is to do something about the existing inequality. Anti-racism is the active dismantling of systems, 
privileges and everyday practices that reinforce and normalize the contemporary dimensions of white dominance. This, of course, also involves a critical understanding of the history of whiteness. And that's a quote from the book How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, which I would recommend. And I hope the image there um, again uh, supplements that definition. How is anti-racism relevant to social work? Now, I'm not going to labour this slide because I'm conscious not everybody uh, here will be a social worker. But just from a regulatory point of view, I've tried to capture the relevant professional standards um, and how they relate to anti-racism. Um, but what you'll see is that they don't explicitly use the term anti-racism, which I think is a kind of deviation from previous um, social work uh, regulations and standards. Um, so that's something that myself and Baz will feel quite strongly about, um, something that, you know, we are um, trying to campaign and, and sort of lobby on with the uh, regulator, um, and that is ongoing. As I mentioned earlier, there is work that we need to do internally in terms of updating our frameworks, policies, procedures, etc. Um, the Baswell Code of Ethics um, is the holy grail uh, to us effectively and that um, something that all of our members sign up to um, and there's some work um, ongoing at the moment to update that in terms of the bedrock of social justice um, and the fundamentals of social work which are anti-oppressive, anti-discriminatory and anti-racist anti practice uh, in, and values and ethics. Um, so there is work underway internally um, but I can confidently say I feel that I feel as an organisation, we've done more than most um, within, so, within social work. Um, and some of that is um, evidenced in the report I mentioned earlier. There are a number of statements that Baswell have published in relation to uh, condemning George Floyd's murder, promoting anti-racism in general. Um, you can see the links there when um, you get your copy of this. There's also um, an article called Confronting the White Elephant, White Privilege in Social Services that may be useful. Um, in terms of academia um, and social work theory, cultural competence is something that is, you know, been pretty much hardwired into the profession for as long as I can remember. Um, but there's little, I think, in the way of actual application and practice of that uh, within social work, but there is a strong body of academia in that regard. And then finally, decolonizing curriculums, which I think is, um, you know, there's a strong movement um, generally around that, but also within uh, social work education uh, and policy as well. How much of a priority is anti-racism in social work, really? Anti-racism in social work must be fully considered and dismantled through collaboration with black and ethnic minority social workers in roles as experts with personal and professional lived experience. This is the only way that social workers of colour's basic needs can be properly met and their wide ranging expertise fully utilised. Of course, this approach can only improve the experiences of black and ethnic minority service users too. It really is just a question of how much of a priority is anti-racism in social work or any other profession. And that for me is the, um, the underlying question, having been in this uh, work now for over a year, um, there have been some green shoots, as I've mentioned, um, but in terms of institutional and structural change, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. And sadly, there's still a kind of deafening silence from some. Anti-racism, so what? Blah, blah, yawn. If the news of police officers taking selfies beside the bodies of two murdered black sisters, the recent far-right violent protests in London, or the racist comments by Suffolk councillors do not outrage you or alert you to the fact that racism is thriving in this country right now, then you really must consider whether you have sleepwalked into being an opponent of anti-racism. 
At the very least, we must be self-aware and honest with ourselves and others when our boredom threshold is reached. Boredom can be subliminal and counterproductive to anti-racism at every level. Everyday microaggressions, including banter in the workplace, can fuel violent racist incidents. Now, you might think that's a bit of a reach, um, but later in my presentation, I'll explore the, uh, the correlation between that. Workplace racism, pigmentocracy versus meritocracy. The covert entrenched and everyday racism in the workplace sometimes indicates the lack of quality, cultural diversity and multicultural education and training available to all staff. Surprisingly, it is rarely acknowledged in social work or any other profession that race is simply a socially constructed idea with no scientific validity, invented and refined principally to oppress people of colour. This has modern and everyday ramifications in the working environment. Black and ethnic minority practitioners have reported to Baswa that PPE has clearly been prioritised and withheld on occasions for their white colleagues. Others explained they were made or ordered to visit service users with suspected COVID-19 with no PPE and no guidance or support. Whilst white managers stayed at the office with their supply of PPE and engaged in racist banter. These perverse experiences can be impossible for victims of naked and slippery everyday racism to articulate to others or reconcile internally themselves. Furthermore, these incidents are normalised and subsumed in many workplace cultures with limited opportunities to professionally offload. And that's why um, I created the group that I mentioned earlier, the BPS. Here is an infographic that I created which is about anti-black racism from people without colour and what that involves. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but just to give you some insight into what anti-black racism uh, involves. So it's an inability to listen to black people's problems and respond with empathy. It's an inability to take direction from black people. An inability to give black people credit an inability to celebrate black accomplishments, assuming black people are less capable, educated, intelligent, conflating anti-black racism with issues faced by people without colour, confusion when black people are successful, downplaying and or glossing over racism in the workplace and society knowingly being condescending and or patronising towards black people, knowingly perpetuating stereotypes about black people, knowingly appropriating black culture, knowingly enforcing anti-black dating preferences, silence when black people experience racism, taking no action when faced with clear evidence of racism, treating black children like adults, adultification, and finally, unnecessarily trying to compete with black people. As I say, it's not an exhaustive list, um, but I hope that gives you some insight into some of the kind of daily struggles people like myself face. This is another infographic created by um, the social work academic I referred to earlier, Gurnam Singh, and this outlines four different types of white identity. Now, I think this applies to people at the individual um, level, a team or group level, and at an organisational level as well. So the four different types of identity are white supremacy, white indifference, white awareness and white allyship. I'll give you some indicators of each, just so you get a sense of what those ident identities can manifest as. Um, so white supremacy includes a fear, loathing, exoticization 
of the non-Y other, which may be overt or covert. It's characterized by the white gaze, a belief that we live in a meritocracy, subscribes to scientific racism. I would also include medical racism within that. Um, white privilege is rationalized as the natural order. And finally, the onus is on black people to accept their place. In the next column, white indifference, some examples of that include that a belief in meritocracy, but also recognizes that some deserving disadvantaged people need help. Um, characterized by a refusal to take a serious look at racism and views anti-racist initiatives as ideological endeavors linked to culture wars and political correctness. Um, a willingness to tolerate, fetishize or pity the non-white other. Happy to make tokenistic gestures but total refusal to accept one's own complicity in the production or reproduction of racism. And finally, the onus is on black people to build up their resilience. In the next column, white awareness. And this involves a belief that racism is real and that it is a product of prejudice plus power. It's characterized by a desire to critically reflect a desire to engage with black issues and people, but only in limited spaces. White privilege is recognized and becomes a source of shame and embarrassment. And finally, the onus is on white people to overcome unconscious bias. And in the final column, white allyship, which is the ideal uh, place that you know we would like people to be. Some examples of that, uh, uh, understanding racism is a complex interaction between structural, ideological, institutional and behavioural processes, but it can be overcome. It's characterised by the desire to take responsibility for change, which is not restricted to behaviour alone. Um, a dynamic approach and creative solutions through co-creation a willingness to share power, privilege, risk and vulnerability. And finally, the onus is on white people to build sustained partnerships with black people. OK, I hope that was a helpful infographic, but as I say, you could look at that in more depth when you get your copy of this uh, presentation. Professional responsibilities. It is imperative that social workers evaluate their roles, moral and regulatory uh, and responsibilities. Current race relations require social workers to be proactive and do our homework to stay contemporarily astute as allies to black and ethnic minority colleagues and service users. Social workers of colour cannot and should not be expected to fix the racism in their workplace. However, those of us who are confident and capable enough with the right support can have a crucial role in educating, empowering and equipping ourselves and potential allies and influencers to enhance and shape anti-racism initiatives in our workplace settings. Everyone has a duty to combat racism and other forms of discrimination in the spaces they occupy. This includes reporting racist incidents when they occur, forming like-minded alliances with peers to tackle key issues, raising awareness and making suggestions for positive reform. Wayne? Yes? It's, it's quarter past ten and it might be a, a, a prudent point to have a break. No problem, that's fine. So what time would you like us to resume, Fran? Um, well, should we say half ten? It gives people a chance to comfort break and make a cup of tea and do a yeah. couple of emails, probably. OK, if we yeah. could say 25 past, that might work better. I'm just thinking in okay. terms of um, time. No, that's uh, and fine. So on. I know people might want to ask questions later. Is that all right? Yeah, Yeah. 10 minutes then, yeah. Excellent. See you shortly then. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye bye.
Okay, are we ready to resume, Fran? Yeah, good to go, Wayne. Yeah, excellent. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Hopefully that wasn't too uh, heavy. Uh, this is just a kind of overview of the presentation, as I was saying earlier. So when you get your copy, please uh, have a kind of exploration of some of the hyperlinks that I mentioned uh, and have sort of littered throughout. Um, but just to continue then. So this is an infographic which outlines um, examples of overt white supremacy, which we know to be socially unacceptable, uh, but then also examples of covert white supremacy, which actually are socially acceptable, it would seem. I'll give you a moment just to peruse those. I should add that it's not my infographic this and there are some acronyms in there that not even I'm uh, familiar with but there are large parts of it which I think do explain um, the feelings and experiences um, that victims of racism have. Okay just to move on. Barriers to meaningful change, meaningful organisational change rather. Before any meaningful change can be achieved, social work leaders must acknowledge the inherent and intrinsic nature of whiteness, white fragility, white privilege and white supremacy as unconscious bias in most, if not all, institutions, structures and organisational cultures. Individual and organisational awareness is an imperative first step for social workers, employers and educators to address workplace racism effectively. And again, I think the imagery there is quite common uh, in a lot of professions in terms of senior leadership. Here is an infographic which outlines the four dimensions of racism, which are institutional, which is about the policies and practices that reinforce racist standards within a workspace or organisation. Then we have structural, which is multiple institutions collectively upholding racist policies and practices, i.e. society, um, but also uh, a number of different professions, the criminal justice system, for example, the mental health system um, and so on. So. Uh, internalised is the next dimension and that is the subtle and overt messages that reinforce negative beliefs and self-hatred in individuals. And finally interpersonal which is about the racist acts and microaggressions carried out from one person to another. You're on mute, Wayne. Oh dear, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I must have pressed something by accident, <laughs> forgive me. Um, this infographic here represents the problem woman of colour in the workplace. I'll give you a moment just to digest its contents. And then I'll go through it. So you can see that the woman of colour enters an organisation. She's met by a white leadership. There's a honeymoon period and the woman of colour feels welcomed, needed and happy. But actually it's a tokenised hire. And the reality begins to dawn. Um, the woman of colour points out issues within the organisation and she tries to work within the organisation structure and policies. She pushes for accountability but she's met with repetitive injury and microaggressions. The response from the organisation is a denial of racism and the organisation denies, ignores and blames the woman of colour. The responsibility of fixing the problem is placed on the woman of colour. People of colour are pitted against one another and that forms a targeted attack. 
and then the woman of colour exits the organisation. I've also missed out retaliation there actually, but just to uh, include that, the organisation decides that the woman of colour is the problem and targets her. The organisation labels the conflict as a communication issue or claims that she's not qualified or not a good fit. And then, you know, the um, the situation unfolds and she exits the organisation. And there's many um, times that I've shared that infographic with um, women of colour, not just social workers, but professionals from various backgrounds. And they've related that, they re related to that either through their own direct experience or through people they know, friends, family, colleagues, etc. OK. You can't read yourself into activism. Anti-racism in social work risks being perceived as radical activism or anarchic ideology. Our social work leaders must reverse this flawed belief system. Social work policy, practice and education needs to properly recognise and reflect that race is a socially constructed idea, as I was saying earlier on. Race remains an unstable concept because it is superficially based on physical appearance. When race was constructed, people knew very little about DNA, genetics and human origins. It is an outdated colonial invention that still permeates modern society. Intellectually and morally, as a profession and as a society, we must see beyond what was predetermined for us centuries ago. So if society is built on plantations of racism, still celebrates racist history and traditions and reminds us daily of the inescapability of white supremacy. It's not enough for social workers and social work organisations to be colourblind or non-racist. We must be proactively anti-racist, otherwise anything else is just tiresome lip service. If anti-racism in social work or any other profession does not exist for, for social workers or practitioners, can it ever truly exist for service users? Anti-racism is absolutely integral to social work. So when will it be given the credence it deserves? Without standing up for our defining values and ethics, what is to stop us succumbing to the pervasive and pernicious postmodern sleaze? Dr. Muna Abde, a leading anti-racism educator, states the work of anti-racism is to fight racism wherever you see it, even in yourself. The struggle cannot be found in the pages of a book. You can't read yourself into activism. Sooner or later, you'll have to make a choice. Do what is safe or do what is right. Now, I mentioned earlier on about um, workplace banter and how that can um, influence or shape um, sort of uh, violence or, you know, racialized violence. Now, this is the infographic that I had in mind, and it is called the Pyramid of Hate. The pyramid shows biased behaviors growing in complexity from the bottom to the top. Although the behaviours at each level negatively impact individuals and groups, as one moves up the pyramid, the behaviours have more life-threatening consequences. Like a pyramid, the upper levels are supported by the lower levels. If people or institutions treat behaviours on the lower levels as being acceptable or normal, it results in the behaviours at the next level becoming more accepted. In response to the questions of the world community about where the hate of genocide comes from, the pyramid of hate demonstrates that the hate of genocide is built upon the acceptance of behaviours described in the lower levels of the pyramid. So looking at this through the lens of race, uh, starting at the bottom, racist biased attitudes may involve stereotyping, insensitive remarks, fear of differences, non-inclusive language, microaggressions and so on. Racist acts of bias may include bullying, ridicule, name calling uh, and so on. Discrimination, that might be economic uh, discrimination, political, educational, employment. 
Above that, we have racist, biased, motivated violence. And that might involve murder, rape, assault, arson. And then above that, at the top, we have genocide, which is the act or intent to deliberately and systematically annihilate an entire people. And of course, there's lots of examples historically, but also currently, some would argue, in different parts of the world, um, including in this country. Three typical responses to anti-racism from social work organisations. Now, again, I think this could apply to any organisation, but social work's what I know, so uh, it's, it's purely in, in that regard. From my cultured social work experience, the responses below generally indicate an organisation's prioritisation and level of commitment or not to anti-racism. The first type of response is to keep silent, keep things the same and hope all this Black Lives Matter stuff just blows over. This kind of inaction and paralysis of fear correlates with and reinforces perceptions of white fragility, white privilege and white supremacy for some people of colour. This type of organisational response usually commends staff for being resilient and deflects attention away from the essential redesign of systems that routinely make people suffer. The second type of response is to publish a lukewarm organisational statement that recycles and regurgitates previous rhetoric on workforce unity with predictable and borderline offensive platitudes, often proposing only superficial changes. And for example, uh, publishing a sympathetic but non-committal knee-jerk brief statement, possibly delegating responsibilities to an already overworked equalities officer, or proposing minor changes to already vague policies and procedures on valuing diversity with little or no accountability. Approaches at this level are usually well-intended but tokenistic and overlook the nuanced obstacles and pitfalls people of colour face every day. Unfortunately, this response is common. And finally, um, the ideal response is to publish an authentic anti-racism action plan outlining significant reforms that commit to specific, measurable, achievable and realistic targets and I suggest some in the next few slides. For example, publishing a strong mi mission or position statement condemning George Floyd's murder and racism in all its forms and committing to Baswood's code of ethics, anti-oppressive, anti-discriminatory and anti-racist practice. This approach interlinks with the anti-racist commitment framework, which again, I'll show you shortly. But the ACID test is to share this presentation with your social work leaders or the leaders of your profession and see what response you get. Here is a visual representation of those three types of response. And this is an infographic of myself up against Manchester United goalkeeper David De Gea. Uh, and the three different responses um, are, the first is where I shoot the ball into the crowd. It's a dismal effort, and that translates into noteworthy silences from organisations. Anti-racism is not discussed, and there are no attempts to acknowledge or address racism. Leaders hope all this Black Lives Matter stuff just blows over. The second type of response is where I hit uh, the stanchion or crossbar and I fluffed it. This translates into cringe position statements and feeble blogs, recycled statements from years ago, regurgitated previous rhetoric on workforce unity with predictable platitudes, but no action. Unfortunately, this response is common. And the final um, outcome is where I score a goal, um, and that translates into authentic anti-racism action plans being published outlining significant reforms that commit to specific, measurable, achievable and realistic targets. And that's the real aim. Here is the anti-racist uh, commitment framework that I referred to earlier on, which um, is something that I developed last year uh, for an article that I wrote 
uh, on how to promote an anti-racist culture. Um, like I said right at the outset, I don't consider myself to be an organisational leader or, you know, to have really any experience in that regard. You know, I still regard myself really as a social work practitioner, even though I'm not in frontline practice anymore. Probably more of an activist these days to some degree, but certainly not, um, you know, an organisational leader. But in terms of this framework, I wanted to outline something based on my uh, experiences of how I feel anti-racism can be implemented at a kind of strategic level within organisations um, to promote positive outcomes for the workforce and not just for people of colour but for everyone. So um, there are four strands to the framework. The first strand is accelerating diversity within and that involves building a workforce more reflective of the communities that we serve by promoting opportunities for black and ethnic minority people to enter and advance within the organisation. And some actions that would uh, derive from that would be a fast track scheme for high potential people from ethnic minority backgrounds, fueled by targeted recruitment for senior leadership and work with partners to help grow diverse talent pools. Selected staff will be mentored by a member of the senior leadership team as they, are, as they progress through different opportunities designed to build their career foundations. This will be maintained by ensuring there are diverse shortlists for every senior management role across the organisation. The next strand is around educating, empowering and equipping the workforce. Um, so the objective would be to transform the working culture to zero tolerance of discrimination, not just racism, but all forms of discrimination. Introducing new immersive training to enhance awareness and support, to underpin inclusive management approaches and meet various learning styles. Now that's something I feel quite passionate about, as you may have seen from my um, sort of different uh, work within anti-racism, some of it activism, some of it, you know, different things, I suppose. I've tried to really use different platforms to make the work and the message more accessible to people um, and not just a one size fits all kind of approach. Um, and again, in terms of uh, implementing anti-racist uh, kind of practices, some actions that might derive from that would be uh, race and culture awareness training will be mandatory for everyone. This will go beyond routine online training by offering guidance, peer support groups, recognising local issues, providing support to equip managers to champion diversity and utilising externalist specialist advice and support as and when necessary. I guess another important factor is about utilising the, um, the knowledge and expertise of the workforce as well. People who want to volunteer, who want to um, you know, develop those kinds of provisions. The next strand is about leading by example. So that's very much aimed at, aimed at managers and senior leaders. So the object, objective is um, to ensure that every senior leader has a greater understanding of the issues faced by ethnic minority communities and are equipped to lead the fight for equality. So actions from that are that every senior leader will commit to either A, having a, an ethnic minority reverse mentor, which I'll talk to you about more shortly, or B, providing professional support to a community organisation serving ethnic minority groups. The final strand is about building transparency, and that's about data collection and usage of data. Any gaps in data collection will be addressed ensuring that senior leaders can be held to account for the progress being made in tackling both discrimination and equality of opportunity. Some key actions from that are that staff are encouraged to self-declare their identity, enabling a rich profile of the workforce's diverse needs to be built. This will underpin the introduction of an annual ethnicity pay audit, backed by any immediate action required an ethnicity dashboard will help to track progress across the colleague life cycle and set targets for senior leaders. This will be published internally, annually. 
Now, some of those uh, actions I will uh, expand on shortly, just so you get a better sense of what some of my practical solutions are in terms of implementing anti-racism. But just so you kind of get uh, a bird's eye view at this stage. Um, here is another infographic on becoming anti-racist. There are three different zones. Uh, starting with the fear zone, the learning zone, and then the growth zone. And then what we can see is some of the thoughts and narratives uh, that people might have within each zone. And it's a really useful infographic. Again, not one that I've created, but um, useful nonetheless. And I think um, one of the slight criticisms of this is that the growth zone, from my point of view, is uh, Becoming anti-racist, it really is a lifelong journey that's both personal and professional, and it, it requires authenticity. So it's difficult to capture that within an infographic. Um, but that's my one slight criticism that I think the growth zone is infinite, really. But again, it's useful. OK, what needs to happen nationally? Oh, are you coming in there, Fran? Could hear. No. OK. No. No. All right. <laughs> no. OK. March on, why March on. <laughs> OK, OK. So um, what needs to happen nationally? The existing national frameworks and initiatives to support social workers of colour are fragmented and optional. This creates confusion and dilution in their coherence and implementation in practice. Social work has a long history of committing to anti-discriminatory practice, but less in the way of practical mandatory implementation or robust challenge on these issues. Now is the time for social work leaders to properly address this by meaningfully and purposefully moving this agenda forward by establishing a mandatory anti-discriminatory national framework that is universal across social work an important first step would be to explicitly reintroduce anti-discriminatory, anti-oppressive practices and anti-racist values and ethics into the professional and qualifying education and training standards. This should also involve partnership working between key stakeholders to enforce these values and ethics across the professional landscape. Key aims and objectives should be to ensure consistency, introduce mandatory requirements, emphasize anti-racist values, and be universally applicable to all social workers like the professional capabilities framework and the professional standards. I know some of that may have been slightly heavy for the non-social workers, so forgive me there. Um, but that is something that I feel quite strongly about and that Baz would do in terms of um, the standards that I mentioned earlier on and you know the explicit use of um, those fundamental values of social work. We all know that organisations can sometimes be avoidant of anti-racism, but as social workers, we must recognise that silence or inaction on racism is complicity with the oppressors. Unfortunately, as a profession, we have been complacent and have much more to do to cultivate equality, diversity and inclusion in the workplace and society. The BAME conundrum. BAME does not describe who I am. BAME is a clumsy, cluttered and incoherent acronym that is opportune for categorising people of colour as a homogenous group when we quite clearly are not. Of course, I cannot speak for all people of colour. I understand that BAME can be operationally helpful when exploring the overarching effects of all things racist. However, it misses so much nuance and subtlety that it can be seized upon by those who wish to deny racism as a white problem. Routinely, I hear people comfortably stating that BAME people can't even agree amongst themselves. This sloppy reductivism leads to terms being invented, such as black on black crime. I never hear about white on white crime, ever. Now the next few slides, I'm coming towards the end of my presentation now, um, but the next few slides 
is very much a kind of idealistic vision um, that I have in terms of what an anti-racist working environment might look like. Um, what can social work employers do to promote anti-racism in the workplace? What would the experience be like for social workers of colour? So the first heading is around recruitment. Anti-racist recruitment targets are set to employ black and ethnic minority senior leaders and educators to better reflect local communities and the workforce where necessary stroke possible. And the reason why I've included that caveat is because I'm aware that, you know, different parts of the country have different demographics. It really is just about reflecting um, local communities better, I feel. The Rooney rule is adopted similar to senior recruitment in American football. This involves at least one person of colour candidate being interviewed for each senior leader vacancy. Continuing with this theme, this theme, this idealistic sort of vision, the next heading is around the workforce. Anti-racism is explicitly promoted in missions and position statements. There's a good example there I've included for when you get your copy of this, along with other forms of discrimination. Uh, it's included in relevant policies and procedures, and it forms part of employees' uh, employment contracts to underline its importance. Workforce diversity and protected characteristics, so ethnicity, gender, religion, sexuality, etc., informs the support available for staff. Training for all staff and organisational policies and procedures. The workforce is encouraged to self-declare their identity and individual and or group well-being at work provisions are developed in partnership with them. Personal well-being is a mandatory agenda item for supervision meetings. That might seem quite rudimentary, but I know from experience it isn't, um, you know, mandatory. It isn't um, something which, you know, you can expect from every supervision, unfortunately. Provisions are also developed for those who have um, experienced workplace trauma associ associated with racism and other types of discrimination. This includes peer-led support groups for members to reflect fully on their personal and professional experiences. By using this identity dashboard approach, organisational efforts are more focused and genuine. Progress is properly managed through a cycle of reviewing data output and periodic verbal or written feedback from the workforce. Safe and informal systems are introduced for social workers of colour in the workplace. For example, discriminatory practices or constructive solutions are made anonymously in an honesty box to empower people of colour without fear of reprisals. Arising issues are then explored in supervision, team meetings or with senior leaders if necessary. I talked about the ethnicity pay audits earlier. And this is about ensuring that any anomalies and discrepancies for black and ethnic minority staff are properly reviewed and resolved. And finally, there's a COVID-19 risk assessment which Baswa uh, created. Um, this is from earlier on in the pandemic, um, and it was about ensuring that that assessment was, was used, particularly because of the disproportionate outcomes for black and ethnic minority social workers, which is still an ongoing concern. But Clearly, uh, we're in a better position now, it seems, as a nation on that. OK, the next heading is on education. Anti-racist education is recognised as being at the heart of developing a more cultured and inclusive workforce and healthy workplace. Education providers decolonise social work training programmes with the input of black and ethnic minority academics, social workers and service users integrated at all stages of program development and delivery. Anti-discriminatory, anti-oppressive and anti-racist practice form a fundamental and mand mandatory requirement of social workers' professional development and registration. This includes a range of educational tools and training opportunities for different learning styles, as I mentioned earlier. 
to ensure quality cultural diversity education is prioritised and valued. Staff continuously learn and better understand microaggressions, stereotypes and how they can demonstrate anti-racist practice. The expertise of specialist external trainers and consultants is instrumental in shaping effective anti-racist approaches with no reliance on tokenistic online courses. And there's a few um, web links there that I've included at the bottom in terms of anti-racist education that you might want to view. Just coming towards the end now, um, but the next heading is on allyship. Anti-racist allyship is understood by senior leaders, educators and practitioners to be vital in combating all manifestations of racism. Educating, empowering and equipping allies to actively support colleagues from marginalised and minority groups is common practice. Allyship actively promotes ways in which managers and staff can become allies or become better allies to support their black and ethnic minority colleagues. Social work employers and educators demonstrate they are willing to keep listening and learning and acting, I should have added there, uh, from uh, people of colour to instigate meaningful change. And again, I hope the images at the bottom there supplement much of what I've tried to capture. Here is an infographic, just to consolidate some of that as well, which is the seven A's of authentic allyship. And those are appetite. Do you have the appetite to immerse yourself in the complex emotive world of race equality? Ask, ask questions about race, be curious, read, learn and educate yourself. Accept, accept that is really a problem. More data isn't needed. Acknowledge, openly acknowledge that the problem needs to be dealt with. Apologise. Express sympathy that racism is affecting people of certain races. Assume, don't. Instead, develop informed views by seeking to understand individuals. And finally, action, which I feel is the most important. Take demonstrable action, steps to establish equality and be accountable. The next heading is on reverse mentoring, which, which I touched on uh, earlier. Anti-racist reverse mentoring enables black and ethnic minority social workers to mentor senior leaders and educators on anti-racism, especially those with identified anti-racist needs. Bit of a euphemism. It is important reverse mentoring allows mentors some autonomy in their approach. Furthermore, mentoring agreements, considering confidentiality, power dynamics and conflict resolution are agreed and signed by both parties at the outset. Otherwise, it's destined to fail, I believe. And finally, leadership programmes. To combat glass ceiling racism, various professional development opportunities are available designed to provide advice and support colleagues from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds to enhance their career progression. Positive representation recognises the disadvantages and obstacles for people of colour and provides opportunities, including traditional mentoring, um, nominations, secondments, shadowing, etc., to support them in reaching their full potential. And finally, due to the representational imbalance, ring-fenced investment and operational resources to support leadership pro programmes is in place. This addresses the lack of black and ethnic minority social workers in senior roles and provides support for those who are. And final slide, um, how can managers change the culture of their organisation? Well, they can start by um, changing what people do rather than how they think. It's easier to act your way to a new way of thinking than to think your way to a new way of acting. Give employees the means by which they can successfully do their jobs. 
and recognizing that the way that problems are treated reflects your orga organizational culture, not necessarily a corporate one. Um, but yeah, your organizational culture. And that's it from me. Thank you for listening to me and I hope that some of that resonated with you. Cheers, Wayne. Thank you. Um, Janet's going to um, provide us with the feedback form that we're going to put in the chat. If Wayne, if you stop sharing your mm -hmm. screen and we go back to a gallery view, um, yeah. either large or small, whatever people prefer. Um, and I think what we'll do now is take Q&A um, and you, you can take charge of that way. So if people just raise their hand mm -hmm. um, and you can just invite them in to ask their question. If Hope you, you get any if you get any difficulties, I can uh, I can help out. But it'd be easier if you uh, if you take the lead on that, I think. No Is that problem. Okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. OK, so um, open it up to the floor. Any questions? Please. No questions, a silly question, unless it's really silly, of course. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, there we go. We're on now. We've got somebody with now. This is where I get struck. <laughs> yes, let's see. We've got three, uh, re three people with a hand up. Suzanne's got a hand up first. Suzanne. Uh, hi, Wayne. Thank you for Hello. that talk. It was really uh, enlightening and, and thought provoking as I thought it would be. Uh, on the very last infographic that you gave, which the, what, I think it was the second day that was ask, and um, it said ask questions about race, be mm -hmm. inquisitive, you know, um, <clears throat> and curious. Yeah. But I hear it commonly said that people, especially now with after the George Floyd thing, that people are scared to even talk about race for fear mm -hmm. of offending or being perceived as racist. Yeah. How I know there's no, you know, golden sort of solution for this, but how do you think we can we can get past that? OK, um, I think uh, a good way of approaching that is from a kind of authentic standpoint where um, questions or curiosity is kind of um, is kind of explored in a sensitive way, in a respectful way. And that that's communicated clearly. So if you're speaking to an individual and let's say you're in a scenario where you think, oh, I might want to, I want sort of want to find out how that feels for them. I feel that might have been a bit racist, perhaps, you know, then I think it's about doing that in a tentative sort of respectful way. Um, as you say, there is no universal uh, sort of formula that I can give you. Um, but those are some of the things to keep in mind, I think, uh, is what I, I would suggest. Um, I think that um, you, there will always be situations where someone will approach somebody else to do with issues of race and somebody might take something the wrong way, you know, and that's just unfortunately how it is. But I think if people start from the point of view of trying to be authentic and true to themselves, which I think I included in one of the images there in my presentation, you know, about staying true to who you are, then at least if, if the situation goes away from you, you can walk away from that thinking, well, I genuinely was trying to be the best person I could in that situation. You know, um, that's probably the best advice I can give, Suzanne. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Wayne, well, you know, I'll pull them in because I've got a list now of people that... Um, oh, excellent. Okay. And if people can just put, pop the camera on as I come in. Jill, do you want to come in next? You're on mute, darling. <laughs> OK, good. you missed a bit about this is probably a silly question. Um, I've only been here uh, 25 years, but um, I I'm feeling uh, I, I just I don't know if it's because of social media, but I get the impression it seems worse in some ways. So I'm just wondering perhaps if you've got a view on whether society seems worse at the moment in terms of its views possibly because it's amplified by social media or you know is it better that things are being talked about or is there something mm. about the fact that it's being denied now as woke uh, to, mm. to be aware is that is that in some ways worse i'm going to turn my camera off i say that it it's uh, connection seems to have went yeah, you froze a bit, Wayne, but you're back with us now. You are back All with right. us. All right. 
Okay, good. <laughs> Fingers yeah, crossed that carries room. on. Excellent. So, yeah, in answer to that question, um, I think there has been a lot of things that have happened over those years that have, you know, um, brought us to this this position. And, and some of those things are, you know, 10 plus years of austerity in this country, I don't think has helped from a kind of socio-economic point of view um, or kind of socio-political point of view uh, as well. Uh, obviously Brexit and the run-up to um, the previous election. Yeah, I think a lot of... Oh, just got a bit of an uh, echo there. Um, so there's been a lot of things, you know, the Trump um, administration as well, although that wasn't directly uh, in relation to this country, I do feel that it influenced a lot of the politics over here. And there's probably lots of other factors that I've missed out as well. I mean, I suppose the overriding feeling that I get is that when I was a teenager in the 90s, I very much felt that the UK was quite multicultural. Um, and although racism still existed, it just felt as though there was a better understanding that we'd made you know, more progress on some of those uh, issues, not just about race, but just generally, I guess, about valuing diversity. And, you know, the kind of the narrative was just very different um, to now. And social media is a, a factor in maybe why it's changed, but it, I don't think it's the whole part of the problem. It certainly perpetuates the problem uh, in some ways, thinking of, uh, you know, trolling and things like that. But uh, in some ways it has its benefits as well. Um, but yeah, it's just really complex stuff, I guess, is the, is the, the, the takeaway. Um, but it certainly changed, I would agree with that. Thanks, Wayne. Sophie? Hi, uh, yeah, um, I just had a question. You mentioned briefly about token training. And mm -hmm. I know myself and my team have been doing a lot of work trying to, I suppose, the, the phrase that's been said and stuck is decolonize the mind. Uh, do you have any advice on how to kind of see what is worthwhile in terms of that training and education and what maybe is as you say kind of just a token training site and wouldn't have the same impact and the same meaning yeah so um what i meant by that was that i think there is a heavy reliance on um online courses i mean i probably better not speak too strongly because this is online but um what what i meant was kind of a sort of tick box approach to anti-racism in terms of just you know kind of oh, do that half an hour course and you'll be anti-racist sort of thing do you know what i mean i don't think it works like that um in terms of what education should look like i'm a strong believer that it should um take many different forms and that's why I've talked about um, various learning styles and, you know, people understanding what their learning style is. You know, there is no particular right or wrong, but just understanding from a personal point of view what what works for you in terms of accessing your kind of information and your learning. And then from that, identifying different um, anti-racist materials that exist. And, you know, there's absolutely loads really um, out there and a lot of it really quality stuff as well. Um, I've got some, some bits and bobs of my own, but there's certainly far more reputable and knowledgeable people in anti-racism than myself. So some of it just comes back to, I think, what I said in the presentation about how much of a priority really is it for people? You know, how immediate is it for them? Because if it is, then there's a wealth of resources out there to absorb. Thanks for your question. Thanks, Wayne. Stephen? Thanks, Wayne. Really thought provoking for me personally. I really enjoyed all that and, and lots of things I want to take away from that too. I wasn't so sure that the, about that red and white shirt you were wearing there in that um, <laughs> screenshot. <laughs> well, that's for another day. Um, it, it's about training and this sense of tokenism. And I'm saying this from the perspective of trying to uh, work with a series of principles that the university structurally is putting in place around um, ad addressing this whole area of racism, but actually from the point of view of student attainment, so right. trying to even out student attainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, my question then is, put simply, is doing the is doing training, learning about this, challenging oneself, uh, having the conversation, is it um, is it best done as a solitary practice, or is it best done as a collective experience? Okay. 
I like that question. It's a good question, that Stephen. Um, my thinking is that it's a combination of both without wanting to sound too much like a politician. Um, I do think it, it needs to be a combination of both coming back to the learning styles point that I was making just earlier that I think it's about you know learning is obviously not just about the actual content it's about the environment I guess in which you're learning as well and for some people you know they prefer to learn in, in groups and that should be perfectly fine um, some of that might be for example thinking of you know your remit that you've mentioned in the university it might be just allowing students of colour that space to be able to offload to each other and through offloading I think a lot can be learned and then there may be other spaces for other members of uh, you know um, student groups to be able to have some sort of dialogue about those issues as well but you know kind of students of colour have that protected space that protected time I think that could enable learning because you know, I, I know groups that have done that um, in other universities and they've had, you know, speakers come in and speak to that group. You know, they've organised it themselves and it's been something they've been able to demonstrate as part of their CPD as well. That, you know, they're actively uh, learning and, and sort of um, seeking out their own learning. Um, so I think, it, you know, I guess the fundamental thing, the takeaway thing from that is for me, I think it's about being creative with the education for anti-racism and okay. not not being a one size kind of fits all kind of approach, as I was saying. And, and I guess building on that, just a, a follow up, I guess, when it, same for staff, really. So mm -hmm. so no one size fits all. I mean, it's, I'd be provoked by a conversation we're having and I know the member of staff has been really active in supporting this kind of activity. And rather than just do the training in isolation, was mm -hmm. built in a collective experience for yeah. a group of people to then let that kind of filter through digest the the content and then talk about it yeah than just, definitely just doing the training in isolation yeah that sounds good i mean one of the things that i've developed is a kind of uh portfolio of anti-racism stuff which as, as i mentioned earlier I'll, I'll hopefully share with you all via fran and you know i i have collated those things purely so that in the future people can have discussion groups they can play some of the videos you know recordings like this in team meetings or at staff away days it doesn't necessarily need the live experience all the time do you know what I mean it, it just requires that commitment I guess that motivation from people just to want to learn as I said the resources are out there um, and just being creative with it yeah <laughs> thanks Stephen Denise Thanks, Fran. Um, and thanks, Wayne. As Stephen said, it's been a really thought provoking morning. I'm just wondering, obviously, um, the majority of our students spend quite a lot of time out in the real world gaining placement experiences. Um, and we are conscious that they're ex whilst we're on a journey within the university, the journey that their placement providers are on might be going at a different pace or a different speed. What advice could you offer us about how we can challenge those placement and industry partners um, and take them partly on the journey that, that we're on? I, I mean, the NHS usually has got the bells and whistles, but I'm not sure that they always implement it appropriately. That's certainly some of the feedback that we get. But we also use a lot of very small providers as well that aren't covered by those blanket policies and, and statements and don't have that infrastructure in quite the same way yeah okay yeah that's uh, an interesting question the first thing that springs to mind I guess is the joined up working between yourselves and those placement providers um, and I'm aware just from past experiences of the kind of power dynamic shall we say or the relationship in that obviously as a university you'll be reliant on those placement providers to provide placements so there's only so much I guess you can um, re request or, or kind of make demands as such um, but I think it does involve joined up working and maybe things like um, maybe things like uh, meetings periodically I'm guessing that happens already routinely where you would meet with them throughout the course of the year maybe more regular than that uh, I guess where uh, race and issues of of racism and anti-racism where that's on the agenda because if it's not explicitly written down and part of the agenda in those meetings I think it's something that could be diluted 
under something like equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and that's, you know, is clearly relevant and part of it, but it's not explicitly racism. So I think it's about that. I think it's about also maybe, um, I don't know if the universities are able to provide training for placement providers as well uh, on this or joint training that you may embark on. Uh, where staff from both the university and placement providers, you know, get together. It could always be like an away day, couldn't it? But that again, you know, uh, race or anti-racism is part of that agenda, part of the theme, maybe. Those are just some things that spring to mind. Ah, thanks. Thanks, Wayne. And uh, somebody's just put in the chat, Wayne, that a, a joint mission statement may be a, a way forward in mm. a vehicle to, to having those discussions and yeah. conversations. Um, I just want to pick up one question in the chat before I go to Ian um, from Naomi. And she's asking, how would you measure the impact of teaching sessions with students? And how do you know it's successful? Okay. <laughs> Answers on a postcard. I oh, think. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do my best with that one. Just to go back to the previous question as well, I just wanted to add something and say that I'm not sure what the relationship is like with Derby City Council, how strong that is. Presumably it's a positive. But, you know, they may that might be a, a good first um, kind of exploration or kind of, you know, have a look at that, because clearly from that, then they would have a relationship with other smaller organisations within Derby. Uh, and that could be a good vehicle um, in terms of training and development. OK, so thank you. And then um, in terms of that question, measuring outcomes for students, I think we could summarise that as um, well. I think some of that will come through as part of the, um, the the work that students undertake as part of their degrees, their qualifications. Some of it will come out in group discussions. And I think also some of it has to come out in part of the direct observations uh, when they're out on placements. Um, I think it's about um, lecturers and tutors and so on, um, having that self-awareness and recognising um, the realities of racism, some of which I think I've captured in this presentation, but actually feeling like they feel confident to make judgments about how racism impacts on students, how um, well educated and well equipped students are to be able to champion racism as qualified workers. You know, but I think it has to start individually first and lecturers, tutors, you know, staff have to kind of feel empowered, equipped and educated around some of this stuff to start with. I think that's my overriding feeling to that that question. Thanks, Wayne. Ian, do you want to come in? Hi, Wayne. Um, Hi. Love the talk. Thank you very much. Some some good things to to consider and think about. Uh, and thanks also for for answering some questions for us as well. Um, I I'm a um, program leader for uh, one of the psychology undergraduate degrees. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we have a number of, of different issues in psychology as, as a, um, a, a subject nationally um, to do with this topic, particularly, obviously, psychology is quite dominated by white thinkers historically and um, therefore, and, and I've also been misused uh, in terms of racism historically as well. And although we try and incorporate those critiques of psychology in our degree I think we've still got more to go nationally in terms of dealing with different ways of thinking about psychology decolonizing the curriculum etc one of the challenges I find as a program leader um, talking to my students of color I, I will have informal one-to-one -one conversations about what's your experience? Mm. Um, and I've been really surprised that they've said you're the first person at university that's ever asked me that, All right. uh, which has been, you know, uh, sorry, first white person that's ever yeah. asked me that. So that's been quite an interesting um, mm. experience. But what I'd like to do is, as a programme leader, to, to get more of those voices, to hear more of that and to get more of their experience, but, but from a broader community rather than those more one-on-one -on -one conversations. Yeah. But I'm also mindful of 
I don't want to necessarily profile groups of students of representing certain demographics mm. um, and then feeling perhaps uncomfortable by the fact that I'm going to them going, well, I want to get your opinion because of a particular characteristic that you have. Mm-hmm. Do you have any advice of how I could tackle that so that I am getting those voices, but not necessarily uh, in a it, well, in an appropriate manner, I suppose mm. is, is whatever that whatever that looks like. Well, yeah, it does. It, I, I think I get what you mean. I mean, it sounds like you've got really kind of um, honourable intentions. I guess it's how you go about, as you say, kind of putting something in place that yeah. doesn't appear as though you're trying to be like a white savior, for example. Exactly. Yeah. But equally, not being indifferent uh, to it. I think um, what I would suggest is perhaps for every intake that you have each year, right at the outset to have a full dialogue with just, uh, you know, any particular marginalised group, obviously we're talking about race today, um, but those who want to have that sort of discussion, having maybe a group discussion so nobody feels put on the spot and just lay your position uh, out as a programme lead and just be really authentic in terms of this is where I am, you know, I sort of just be really honest and transparent in the clearly you won't know everything about anti-racism but you want to do the right thing you're committed and and also that you want the program to be as accessible as it can be to everybody and to be representative of kind of balanced history and and so on i think if you set your stall out in that way i would hope that most people would connect and relate with that and even if they didn't at least you would could almost um sleep that little bit lightly given your intentions do you know what I mean that you're doing everything really that that you can I think that's what I would uh, suggest okay that's really helpful thank you very much um I'll ask a question now Wayne because nobody else has got their hand up um you talked about the um identification with the acronym BAME Mm. and complexities that that creates yeah. and the difficult conversations i have the same um conversation with myself and some others about the word decolonization because right. i think it it offers the same confusion um as an acronym well not as an acronym but just as a term yes. um, and i just wondered what your position on it was why um why is decolonization sort of problematic for you then just so because i because I'm not sure that people actually understand what it means. Okay. Oh, and I they see. associate right. it with with historical um, connotations I of, see. you know, you know, very sort of uh, broad terms of, of slavery and, yeah. and such like. And I, I'm not sure that when you actually have a discussion with most people, mm. they everybody's got their own interpretation. I think mm. that's mm. that's the difficulty I have with yeah. it. Yeah. I, th- I agree. And I think um, anti-racism, I think, is riddled with terms like that, which are, you know, in, in some ways problematic, in other ways kind of, well, actually, there's no real alternative or u- universal alternative that everybody will subscribe to. Um, you know, BAME is one. Um, mm. There's, um, you know, there's there's many others. I'm, I'm thinking of um, I allyship. Just- allyship just, at the moment is a kind of contested term as well sorry yeah. Gonna, yeah. well I was just going to sort of give an example of every you know within education um most universities are referring to decolonizing the, their reading lists for example mm-hmm. um you know what does that actually mean and I I think it's it I think it's more than just about um a response to being anti-racist so I just, it's just interesting, isn't it, how we adopt names and acronyms and, and pro- perhaps don't give enough explanation about what they actually mean. I think um, some of these terms are uh, open to interpretation. I think with decolonization, for example, um, it's not something that, um, I, guess, I guess it's quite an academic term, isn't it? And so if you're not in and around academia, you know, somebody far removed from that, it might be like, oh, it's just another big word that them lot say, you know, and I suppose not so long ago, I might have thought that myself, in all honesty. But um, I think it serves a purpose, decolonization. It's not um, infallible, but very few words are. Um, but for me, what it means is about reviewing, sort of revisiting and reviewing um, education curriculums um, 
and trying to give more of an accurate account uh, and a balanced uh, account of um, other uh, kind of more mar marginalized or minoritized uh, academics whose work probably hasn't had the spotlight but they have just as much validity and credibility in their work about you know incorporating their work into curriculums for me that's what it's about but in all honesty I'm not an academic and that's where my limitation kind of um, where my limitations are uh, and it's just about that equality isn't it but from a curriculum point of view really you know my yeah. simple and view and, and I and I th I think you've kind of exposed and hit the nail on the head that um, it, it can't be a word that is only educationally based mm -hmm. because it becomes inaccessible and yeah. that's exactly what we're trying to do with reading lists and the curriculum is make them accessible yes um so yeah. it, it's counterproductive i think so yeah no that's great thank you yeah no problem i suppose broader than that as well is that there is this void of knowledge and education and some of that is because it's not on the curriculum within schools so people reach adulthood and they'll you know uh, move on into adulthood and they'll think maybe they know the facts but actually a lot of their education maybe comes from mainstream media as opposed to any sort of formal education so again it's complex isn't it but yeah. um, I hope that's been helpful this morning for everyone anyway I, I've certainly found it very helpful I'm sure others have um, is there any final questions we want to pose to Wayne before we say cheerio no so, no. no well, I, I are, think you're the uh, are just putting no. stuff in the chat, chat now, oh. Wayne. So that's just to to thank oh. you. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you all this morning. Uh, and like I say, I hope you've got something from the presentation. I will share the presentation with Fran and the portfolio. Have a look through it. Hopefully, you know you can use that personally and professionally. Um, and all the best. Thanks, Wayne. All right. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.